There were many, many times where I had, uh, had made plans to not be here. Didn't think that I had the, the strength to get through another day. They told my father that he had inoperable pancreatic cancer. He didn't want to be alone, so for three months I stayed either on his couch. The phone rang at 3 o'clock in the morning, my cell phone, and it was my husband calling, and he said, I'm not sure how to tell you this, but I just had a call from our son Christopher, who lives in Wisconsin, and he's on his way to the hospital with anxiety, or his heart is racing, and he can't seem to calm it down. I can't tell you how it feels to be a mother and not be able to get to your child. When my dad passed away, that I was kind of elevated to head of the family almost. Just the weight of everything had finally uh, crushed me and trying to do things on my own still, I guess, as well. There was a point where I just, I couldn't take it anymore. And I turned to um, drugs and alcohol as a coping mechanism because I didn't know anything else. I knew there was God, but I wasn't even close to seeing him or being in reach of him. Welcome, everybody. It is so good to have you here today. I hope you're having a great weekend so far, and I'm glad that you've included Parker Hill Community Church as a part of your weekend as we continue this teaching series entitled Overwhelmed. Now, before I jump in today, I just, I just have to say that, you know, Paul McGinnis did an incredible job teaching last weekend, didn't he? I mean, you can give him a hand. I thought that was just... If you weren't here, you not only missed hearing a great message, you also missed seeing him give the entire message while walking on a treadmill. And that is not easy. That was just absolutely amazing. And I think if you saw that, that's one of those messages that you won't forget for a long time. In fact, I was so inspired by that that I decided to give this entire message walking on a Stairmaster. Unfortunately, it broke just before the service, so we're going to have to wait for another time for that. Uh, really, here's what we're going to talk about today. What to do when you're overwhelmed by feelings of insignificance. And as I introduce this message, let me just say this, that in my opinion, there are some things in this world that are insignificant. That the things that I look at them and they seem to have like absolutely no purpose. Yeah, and uh, y y let me just give you two words, okay? Chia pet, if you disagree with me. Uh, you know, I look at that, and I, I just have one question, okay? And the question is, why? I, I mean, like, there's life there, and there's growth there, and I'm not even sure what it is that grows, but, but there isn't any real significance or any real purpose to that. In, in fact, I discovered that you can only buy those in stores around Christmas time, because I tried to buy one this week. And I, and I think the reason for that is this. I'm guessing that probably 90% of them are bought as white elephant gifts at Christmas time. Let me take a survey here. Just uh, You can raise your hand if you've ever either bought or had a Chia Pet. Okay, don't be embarrassed on every campus. Raise your hand nice and high if you've ever had or bought a Chia Pet. Okay, now keep your hand up for a minute. How many of you still have it? Yeah, nobody, because they, they last like a couple months and then they go in the trash can, right? See, he, here's what I've, ne I've never had this conversation. I, I've never said to somebody, what was it that really changed things in your life? What was the turning point for you? Nobody has ever said, it was when I got that Chia Pet. <laughs> like, it, there are just some things in this world that are not significant, that just seem to have no meaning or no purpose. But, but let me give you a contrast to that. This is a picture of a guitar. And a guitar is something that has meaning, it has purpose, it has significance. And if you take a guitar and you put it in the hands of a skilled musician, it creates music and it can communicate truth and it can draw people toward the heart of God and it can be a blessing to them. In fact, we've already experienced that. But here's what, here's what I see so often. I think far too often we allow ourselves to settle into a chia pet kind of existence where we live lives that have no real significant purpose, and we begin to listen to the lies that say, you know, you're too old, you're too dysfunctional, you've blown it one too many times, you're too ordinary, 
and we drift into a life of insignificance when at the same time, if you're a follower of Christ, your heavenly Father wants you to live as an instrument of blessing and meaning and purpose to others. And today I want to look at the story with you of a man in the Bible who struggled deeply with feelings of insignificance. He's one of the most famous people in the Bible. You've probably heard of him, and even if you didn't grow up in church, you probably know at least part of his story. His name is Moses. And uh, many of us, I think, as Americans, we have an image in our mind of who Moses was, and it's not an image that necessarily comes from the Bible. It's an image that comes from, from Hollywood, because every Easter for the last 40 years since 1973, every Easter Sunday, ABC broadcasts that movie, The Ten Commandments, and when I was growing up in my family, we would watch that almost every year as a family. And so when I think of Moses, the image that comes to my mind is, is the image of, of Charlton Heston, right? He's just standing there looking so confident, and he's muscular, and he's, he's chiseled, and he's got that really cool Duck Dynasty kind of a beard. And he, he's like a guy who never had a moment of self-doubt in his life. But then if you read the Bible, you discover that that, that really isn't the whole story, that, that Moses was, in fact, a very, very ordinary man who struggled at times with insecurity, who made some very serious mistakes in his life and came to a point in his life where he felt overwhelmed by insignificance. And as we think about his life and as we look at the Scriptures today, uh, there's one principle that I hope you'll go home with, one very important principle, and it simply goes this way. Never mistake a detour for a dead end. Never mistake a detour for a dead end. Because if you're a follower of Christ, there are no dead ends in your life. There may be some detours. In fact, there probably will be. In fact, here's how Jesus said it in John 16. He said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Sometimes trouble of your own making your own choices, sometimes because of other people's choices, sometimes just the fact of living in a fallen world, you will have trouble. There are going to be detours. But take heart, he says, I have overcome the world. There's never a dead end. So let, let's talk about Moses. Uh, inside your bulletin, there's a note sheet. You can go ahead and, and take that out. On the outside is what we'll cover here today. On the inside are what are called the app notes, and that's what we hope that you'll take a look at throughout the week this week and continue learning after you leave here today because we believe that what you learn on your own is probably more important even than what we will learn here together today. But today we're going to look at the story of Moses, and, and his story is told in the Bible in the book of Exodus, and it covers a number of chapters. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at what I would call the Cliff Notes version or the Reader's Digest version of his life and his story. And you find it in Acts chapter 7. The passage is right there on the note sheet. And in Acts chapter 7 here, a guy named Stephen is talking, and he's really just recounting the history of the nation of Israel and how God used that nation to bring a Messiah into the world. And he comes to verse 20, and he begins to tell the story here of, of Moses. And, and he breaks it down into three sections and three chapters in his life, his first 40 years, his second 40 years, and then his life from about the age of 80 on. So let me begin here in verse 20. It says this, at that time Moses was born and he was no ordinary child. In other words, he had a kind of an odd and, 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 and somewhat confusing start in life. It says for three months he was cared for by his family and when he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. So a little background on that in case you don't know his story. Moses was born at a very dark time in the history of the Jewish people. They were slaves at this point in history within the Egyptian empire. But the population of the Jewish people had grown so quickly and so significantly that they began to outnumber the Egyptian people. And the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, felt threatened by that. So he issued a command that every little Jewish baby boy that was born had to be put to death. Uh, this was a very, very dark and difficult time in their history. But when Moses was born, his mother, who was very wise and very clever, kept him for three months, and then she, she took him and put him in a basket in the Nile River, 
And it was there in the Nile River that he was noticed by none other than the daughter of the Pharaoh. And she took him in and raised him as her own son. In fact, she was the one, it says in Exodus chapter 2, she was the, the one who named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. That's what his name literally means. His name means found in the water. So back to verse 22. He's growing up. It says, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in speech and action. And so you look at him at this point in his life, and he, he appears to have it all together. I mean, he's well-educated, he's eloquent, he's got connections, he's got power, but deep down in his heart, he's searching for something. Because you have to understand, he was a man who didn't really belong anywhere. He was raised in an Egyptian home, but he wasn't really Egyptian. He was really by race Jewish, but he couldn't identify with the Jewish people because they were slaves and that wouldn't look good. So he really didn't feel like he fit anywhere, didn't belong anywhere. He was just Moses. He was just Mr. Found Me in the Water. And there comes a point in his life when, when this kind of turmoil in his heart just comes bubbling to the surface. Look at verse 23. When Moses was 40 years old, and by the way, men do strange things sometimes when they turn 40, like order the Bowflex machine and start driving a Harley Davidson, you know, and begin to get a little bit introspective. This is what happens to Moses. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. So, so he seems to want to figure out who, who he really is and, and where he really fits, and he, he seems to want to connect with the people of his own race, but in, in trying to make a connection with his past, he does something irrational and something very impulsive. Verse 24, he saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Now, now why would he do that? Verse 25 is so fascinating to me because it gives us a glimpse into his heart. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them. But they did not. Like, he wanted so badly to help his own people, and I think deep down inside he wanted so badly to be accepted by his own people that he thought that if he just reached out and helped them, that they would embrace him, that they would accept him, but, but they didn't. In, in fact, here's what happens, verse 26. The next day Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to rec reconcile them by saying, men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, who made you ruler and, and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And, and all of a sudden he realizes, like word is out. They know what he did. And pretty soon Pharaoh is going to know what he did. And, and they're going to come after him. And so he runs. Verse 29, when Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. And so Moses runs. He goes, he goes hundreds of miles away from Egypt, and he settles in a place called Midian, which was in the middle of the Arabian desert. And I want to point out two words to you in verse 29. You can circle these two words or underline them or at least just remember them. It says here, he settled. And those two words caught my attention because I think that's exactly what all of us do when we feel like we're at a dead end. We, we settle. We settle for living a life that is way below our potential. We settle for living a life of mediocrity where we expect nothing great and we attempt nothing great. I mean, this was Moses. He's alone, starting over with nothing. He's 40 years old. And he goes to a place that's just so desolate. In fact, there are very limited career options. Here's what he has to do for a career. It says, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. So, so the prince of Egypt ends up taking care of sheep. If you know anything about shepherding, you know it was not a prestigious occupation. It did not take a great deal of skill. I mean, you talk about downward mobility. You talk about a change in your circumstances. He had had wealth and power and connections, and now it was all gone. 
And so if I were to title the second 40 years of his life, I would describe it this, this way. In the first 40 years, he was searching for something. In the next 40 years, he was just settling for nothing. I mean, it just feels like it's over. It just feels like a dead end. In fact, there's a very interesting detail in Scripture that gives you a glimpse into his heart and tells you how he was feeling at this point in his life. Moses goes to Midian. He meets a girl. They get married. They have a couple of kids. And listen to what he names his firstborn son. It says this, Zipporah, and that was his wife, Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become an alien in a foreign land. And and so he names his son Gershom, which literally means, I don't belong here. I mean, can you imagine the family introductions? Hi, my name is found in the river, and this is my son. I don't belong here. And, and I think what Moses was saying was something far more than geographical. I, I think what he was saying in giving this name to his son was this, like, this isn't where I ever expected to be at this point in my life. This isn't the way I thought my story was going to go. This isn't the destination I was aiming for. I don't belong here. And you just get the sense that Moses was a man at this point in his life who was dealing with a great deal of regret. And his circumstances had led, as far as he could see, to a dead end. And and you know what we do so often? We do the same thing. We allow the failures of our past to dictate what we think our future is going to be. And we all have them. We all have a past with hurts and regrets and issues. It's just a part of life. A few years ago, um, my family and I visited Yosemite National Park in, in California. And in the southern part of the park, they have this grove of giant sequoia trees. It's just absolutely fascinating. And while we were there, the park ranger showed us a cross-section of one of these trees, and he explained how the rings of the tree tell the story of the tree. And this is true of every tree, that every one of those rings represents a year in the life of that tree. And and when when you have a, a ring that's fairly wide, that was a good year. That was a a year with a lot of rain and a lot of growth. And if you have a ring that's very narrow, that was a year of drought. It was a difficult year. And sometimes you can tell in the ring of the tree when there was a fire because it left a scar or or there might have been an insect infestation and and you could read that in, in the rings of the tree. And the rings of the tree tell the story of the history of that tree. And I, I wonder sometimes if somehow people could see a cross-section of our lives, what they would read in those rings. You know, maybe there's a a ring in your life that tells the story of those years growing up when you heard the nicknames and the bullying and you hated to go to school every day. Or there's a ring that shows your spouse slamming the door for the last time and your marriage ending just like that. Or maybe there's a ring in your life that shows a scar from a father who never said those words, I love you, or a mother who never said those words, I'm proud of you. Or maybe there's a ring in your life where you were abused by someone or where you just made some very foolish choices for a season in your life. See, we all have those rings. We all have those mistakes and those hurts and those disappointments. But the question is, how are you going to respond to those things? Will those things define you? In fact, I would suggest to you that God is far more concerned with our future than he is with our past, and sometimes God even leverages our past in order to give us a more significant future, because that is exactly what happens with Moses. Let me pick up in verse 30, and this is on the back of the note sheet if you're following there. It says, after 40 years had passed, so if you do the math, at this point Moses is 80 years old. He has spent the last 40 years of his life living in the desert, taking care of somebody else's sheep. And if I were to to describe those 40 years of his life, I think there are three words that would capture that season of his life so well. The first word would be this, obscurity. Because out there in the desert, nobody knew who he was. 
Nobody cared where he had come from. Nobody cared who his mother was. Nobody cared that he had gotten the best education in the world in the schools of Egypt. Out there in the wilderness, he was just Moses. He was just Mr. Found Me in the River. It was a life of obscurity. Secondly, it was a life of monotony. He comes home every day, right? And his wife says, how was your day, honey? And he says, it was good. What'd you do today? I watched the sheep. They went over there, and then they came back over here, and then they went over there. That was my day. Monotony. Third word would be drudgery. I mean, here's a man in his 60s and his 70s still doing physical labor, hiking around the desert, cleaning poop up after the sheep. I mean, this was the life he lived for 40 years, obscurity, monotony, drudgery. But let me say this. Those 40 years, in my opinion, were not wasted years. Those 40 years in the wilderness were 40 years of training. Because if you know his story, you know that God's going to show up and God is going to invite him to lead the people of Israel to the promised land. He's going to invite him into a leadership position. And I would suggest to you that Moses was prepared for leadership, not so much in the palace, but in the desert. I mean, the 40 years in the, in the palace, that was important because he learned the language and the culture of, of Egypt. But I would suggest to you that it was the time in the desert that really shaped his character and turned him into a leader. Because in times of obscurity, what we learn is humility. When the spotlight is off and the titles are gone and the position is gone, then it's just the real you with the real God and, and it's very humbling. And he would need to be a humble leader because the only good leaders are humble leaders. And you know what we learn in times of monotony? We learn to be patient. We learn to wait. We learn to trust in God. And, and, and Moses would need to be a very patient leader because he was going to lead thousands of people on this journey from slavery to the promised land. And it would be just like taking your kids on a long journey where they keep asking the same question over and over, which is, are we there yet? And he had not two or three or four, he had thousands of people whining. Are we there yet? That would take patience, and it was in times of monotony that he learned patience. And in times of drudgery and the daily grind, that's when we learn perseverance. And as a leader, he would need to clean up a lot of messes. And so in, in the desert, he was cleaning up messes and learning what it meant to persevere. You see, Moses became a leader in the desert, and this is still what God does today. That it's in those times when we are in monotony and drudgery and, and, and obscurity, when God shapes our character and when he strengthens our faith and when he prepares us for the future. And so if you're a mom and it's every day changing diapers and chasing kids and making meals and it's getting so old and it feels like a dead end, you just don't know where your faithfulness is going to lead you and what impact that might have on your kids someday. And if you're working what seems like a dead end job and you can't stand your boss and it's just day in and day out, and it's so old, you don't know what God may want to do in your heart in this time in your life. Or maybe you're a student and you're studying these things that just seem to have no relevance. But it's in this time when God may want to teach you integrity and character and a work ethic. And this was what was happening in Moses' life for 40 years. He was in the wilderness. And my friend, don't ever waste your wilderness. Don't waste that time in the desert. So finally, age 80, God shows up. He says, Moses, I've got a job for you. Verse 30, after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight. As he went over to get a closer look, he heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. He says, I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. And there's a couple of phrases here that you need to catch. God says, I have heard their groaning and I will send you. 
I have heard their groaning and I will send you. In other words, here's what he, he was saying. He was saying, Moses, I want you to be the answer to the prayers of my people. Let me give you a radical thought. Have you ever considered the idea that God may want you to be the answer to somebody else's prayers? You know, maybe there's somebody in your life who is just spiritually thirsty and they're looking for answers and they're crying out to God and God is nudging your heart and he's saying, I want you to take a step. Maybe, see, maybe you could be the answer to someone else's prayer. Maybe there's somebody in in your circle of friends or in your small group who's just struggling financially and they're crying out to God. Maybe God is nudging your heart to meet that need and maybe you could be the answer to someone's prayer. Or maybe it's somebody in your neighborhood, an older person who just needs someone to care about them. And, and they cry out to God for someone and maybe, maybe you could be the answer to that person's prayer. And God says, Moses, I've heard their groaning and I want you to be the answer to their prayers. And Moses responds, and look at how he responds. Back in the book of Exodus, chapter three, verse 11. But Moses said to God, he said, who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And and I think in his heart he was saying this. He's saying, God, you know, if you'd have come to me 40 years ago, when I was young and I was strong and I still had connections and I had power, 40 years ago I could have done something, but not now. Now I'm just an old fugitive shepherd out here in the middle of nowhere. You've got the wrong guy. It's too late for me. And here's what, here's what God responds in verse 12. And li- listen to this. He doesn't, say, he, he doesn't say, oh, come on, Moses, you're being too hard on yourself. You know, you, you just need to believe in yourself. You just, you know, the power of positive thinking. Today is the first day of the rest of your life, all that stuff. He doesn't say any of that. God said, I will be with you. You know what he's saying? He's saying, you know, you're right, Moses. You're not really up to the task. It's true. But that doesn't matter because it doesn't depend on you because I will be with you. Now, here's what I don't want you to hear me saying today. Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying to you, get up get back at it, get back on your feet, believe in yourself, you've got what it takes. Okay, that's not the point of the message. You don't have what it takes. And I don't have what it takes. And the point of the message is that not that we are so great and so awesome and so special. The point of the message is this, that we serve a God who is great and awesome and powerful. And if we will simply entrust ourselves into his hands and follow his leadership and allow him to flow through us, then our very insignificant dead end kind of lives will take on significance and amazing things will happen. It's kind of like this this baseball bat that you see on the side screens. It's just an ordinary bat. It it was just made from an ordinary ash tree somewhere. There's nothing really special in that bat in and of itself, but what makes that bat so significant was who used it. That bat was, was owned by Babe Ruth. In fact, that's the bat that he used to hit the first home run out of Yankees Stadium when it was first built. And so that bat... The last time it was sold at auction, sold for $1.3 million for a piece of wood. See, here's the truth. You and I are just very ordinary people. We really are. I mean, you've got your unique giftedness and your unique skills, and we've all, all got our particular DNA, and I understand all of that. But the bottom line is this. In and of ourselves, we are not all that significant. But when we entrust our lives into the hands of God, Our lives take on incredible significance. And so God says to Moses, listen, this is not a dead end in your life. I've chosen you. Your character has been refined. Your heart has been humbled. Your past has been forgiven. And I'm not done with you. I want to use you. And this conversation continues. And eventually, here's what happens. And I love the simplicity of this verse, Exodus 4.20. So Moses took his wife and sons put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt, and he took the staff of God in his hand, and he literally changes the course of history. 
Listen, my friend, if you've been wounded, if you've ended up in the wilderness of life, if you've ever been tempted just to settle in and give up and let go of any dreams or hopes for significance in your life, you don't need to do that. And if you're a follower of Christ, I believe that one day, sooner or later, you're going to sense the whisper of God saying to you, it's a new day. Take my hand. Walk out of this desert. Because I've got something for you to do. You are the answer to someone's prayer, and I will give you the strength, and I will give you the wisdom, and I will give you the words to say. Let me close with this. 200 years ago, there was a violin maker in Italy by the name of Antonio Stradivari. He made the world's best violins. To this day, their sound has never been duplicated. Their sound is almost supernatural. It's, it's incredible. Most of them aren't even played anymore. They're in, viol- they, they're in museums somewhere, and, and, and they, they aren't even used. And, and scientists over the years have, have tried to figure out what made them so unique, and they've come up with a number of theories, but the most common theory is based on the kind of wood that he used in his violins. You see, An- Antonio uh, was not a very wealthy man. He was very poor. And so he wasn't able to buy the fine woods that other violin makers were able to afford. And what he would do is he would pull the wood for his violins out of the sludge in the harbor where he lived. And that wood, once he pulled it out, he would wash it off and he would clean it up and he would dry it and then he would slice it down and he would turn it into a violin. And they discovered that the wood, as it was lying in the sludge of the harbor, microbes would go into it and they would hollow out the center of all the cells. And so when he made the violins out of this discarded wood, every single cell became like a resonating chamber for the music and it was beautiful. And there are times in life when we find ourselves in a season of life that just feels like we're in the sludge and it's never gonna change. But I would suggest to you that in those times of life, that may be the very time when God is transforming you and changing you and preparing you for the next phase of your life in which he will do something really, really significant through you. Today, as we wrap our time up together, we're going to participate in the celebration of communion. And as we do that, we just want to look beyond all the challenges and all the difficulties of our lives and focus our attention on a greater reality, and that's the reality of God's radical love for his people. And here's how we do that at Parker Hill Community Church. There there are four tables in the room. There are two at the back and two at the front, and on each one of those tables, there are some bowls of grape juice, and there are some plates of unleavened bread. And that bread represents the body of Christ that was broken on that cross, And the juice represents his blood that flowed from his broken body and stained the timbers of that Roman cross. And for those of us who are Christians, for those of us who are followers of Christ, those symbols are a powerful, powerful connection to our faith. And they remind us that we follow a Savior who has set us free. And if you're here today and you're a believer, you're welcome to participate with us in this time of worship. If you're not yet a believer or if you're not prepared to participate, that's okay. You can just let everyone else move on by you. And in just a moment, we'll see a video, and that will give us a few minutes just to think and to reflect on what we've talked about today. And then the band is going to come and lead us in a song. And at any time during that song, you can come, come to one of these tables and just take a piece of that, that unleavened bread and dip it in that juice and partake of that. And as you hold that and as you taste that, let it remind you of the cross where Jesus died. Because here's what the cross tells us. It tells us the truth about ourselves. That your sin and your guilt and your shortcomings and your failures and all those rings in the story of your life, that is not what defines you. Because in Christ, if you are in him, you have been loved and forgiven and washed and set free and you are blameless. And you may go on some detours, but because of his grace, those detours will never, ever, ever be a dead end.